Good afternoon, good night, good morning to everyone joining us from all around the world. My name is Caroline Brown from Hamilton Medical, and today I'm delighted to welcome a new expert to our series, Professor Jean Damien Ricard from France. He's joined by a familiar face from this series, Dr. Tommaso Mauri from Italy. Together, they will discuss the question of intubation in hypoxemic respiratory failure, does time matter? If anyone's joining us for the first time today and isn't familiar with the format, your cameras and microphones are switched off by default, but you can ask any questions you like using the Q&A tool. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. The session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you a few days after the event in an email. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to our interviewer for today, Tommaso Mauri. Tommaso, the stage is yours. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. We are here for this uh, interesting discussion on when to intubate during high flow treatment with uh, our expert, Jean Damien Ricard. He is professor in uh, Paris and the head of the ICU at Louis Murier, Louis Murier Hospital in uh, Paris. He is uh, an expert in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, studied the high flow extensively and participated to the writing of the guidelines on high flow using intensive care medicine. Hi, Jean Damien, and welcome. Hello. So, Jean Damien will give a, a brief uh, talk, but before knowing the expert opinion on this topic, we would like to know your opinion on this topic. So we start with the poll. So I can uh, launch this poll and everybody should be able to watch. So the question is, for how long would you keep a patient on nasal high flow before intubation? With the maximum flow, NFIO2, say above 50 liters per minute, above 80% FIO2, would you keep this patient six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours? before intubation if there is no improvement okay you can answer we keep this we have 12 answer please there is no right answer we want to know your practice your current practice to discuss there is no correct answer and no truth here just the way you would do it before seeing there is any improvement so we leave uh, 30 seconds more. So six hours, no improvement intubation or 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, or very long four days, 96 hours. Okay, 10 seconds more, if anybody wants to add. Okay, we end the poll here. And I can share the result with Jean Damien and everybody. Jean Damien, do you want to comment? Well, I think it's very interesting to see that we have some diverse answers. And as you mentioned, there's no exact, no real truth. And what I'd like to share with you is my views on how to have a clear decision of the exact at what time you need to intubate these patients. So I think it's very interesting to have these results. Yeah, so no, very few will go uh, uh, longer than 24 hours. Is this uh, correct? Let's see what are your suggestions. Okay, so you should be seeing my, uh, my presentation right now. Uh, so thank you very much for the so invitation. It's uh, a pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon to share uh, my thoughts on intubation in hypoxemic respiratory failure and the question of, as we've just mentioned, does time matter? So if I can, my slides don't want, oh, sorry for that. Uh, here are my conflicts of interest in relation with, uh, with this talk. Um, several companies providing laser high flow devices have contributed either to research or lecture fees, as you can see. So the context of this talk is that you know that um, a quite large proportion of patients will require intubation uh, in case of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, whatever their initial ventilatory support, whether it's oxygen, standard oxygen, nasal high flow, or 
on non-invasive ventilation. We also know that there is a clear link that exists between prolonged and perhaps excessive use of these non-invasive strategies and mortality. So the question is, how do we find the right balance be between not in intubating every single patient, uh, because uh, of course we will expose uh, unnecessary too many patients to the complications of mechanical ventilation, but on the other hand, how do we avoid the risks of late intubation? So what's at stake in this discussion? Well, obviously, it's to identify with precision those patients that will require invasive mechanical ventilation to avoid unnecessary intubation in those who do not, and to intubate these patients early to avoid excess mortality related to delayed intubation. And obviously, Behind this is the idea of what's the best non-invasive ventility support strategy, but I won't be addressing this this afternoon. Um, there is, as I mentioned, some link between timing of intubation and mortality during acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And I'd like to illustrate this uh, with two short slides. The first one is a, a really old data. Um, it wasn't focusing directly on uh, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, but it was the timing of reintubation in patients that were failing extubation. As you can see in this study, authors had uh, divided the time to reintubation in several segments, and they looked at what was the mortality of these patients. And as you can see, as further or as the longer the time to reintubate the patients, the higher the mortality. It's not a clear direct correlation, but you can see an association between timing to reintubation and outcome. And I think we need to have these data in mind. When we look at the data in ARDS, I would just pick up one study. This is a multi-center prospective observational cohort. Um, above 450 patients were enrolled with ARDS, and they looked at the timing uh, of intubation and its relation to outcome. In this cohort, some patients were never intubated. Some were intubated early on, on the day of the diagnosis of ARDS, and some were intubated late after 24 hours. As you can see, there's a clear distinction in terms of outcome in these patients. Those patients that were considered late intubation had a much stronger mortality rate than those that were either not intubated or early intubated. And this difference persisted after 24 months. So there is a clear, and there's other studies showing this, a clear link between the timing of intubation and mortality in case of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So what do we expect from nasal high flow in this context? Obviously, if we place ourselves on a patient's perspective, we want to alleviate dyspnea, improve oxygenation, decrease work of breathing, and we hope this will avoid intubation and reduce mortality. On the other side, uh, the healthcare institution, we want to reduce on the demand for ventilators, ideally delay or even better avoid admission to the ICU and help uh, manage the, beds in the bed shortage in case of pandemic. I'd just like to highlight the fact that uh, it's very important to have a clear idea of the settings and the optimal settings of nasal high flow in this situation. And there's very nice work from Tomaso Murray indicating that the higher the flow, the greater the benefit. And this is what we highlighted in this review. So bear in mind that all the uh, beneficial effects of nasal high flow are flow dependent. So it's important to have in mind that you need to have the highest flow to benefit the most from the device. So what's the current duration of nasal high flow in hypoxemic respiratory failure? In other words, and this was uh, related to the question we asked you at the beginning of the poll, how long can I keep my patient on nasal high flow? And am I taking risk in prolonging a non-invasive strategy? There is some data that I'll share with you to, and this will be one start of the, the answers to, to, to the poll. This is the Ferrari study, you know, that compared nasal high flow to standard oxygen and the combination of nasal high flow and non-invasive ventilation. On this slide, you can see the median duration before intubation in these three groups, and we will just focus on the nasal high flow. And you can see that the median duration was 27 hours, uh, was a maximum intercoital from eight to 46 hours. So this came in quite nicely with your answers, and this is a result from, from this study. 
Um, another study there in, in COVID-19 patients, and perhaps it's not exactly the same timing, there again, study comparing nasal high flow to standard oxygen. And as you can see, time elapsed from randomization to intubation was 22 hours in nasal high flow, slightly higher in conventional oxygen therapy, but there again, in the same range of approximately 20 hours. In one of our studies uh, published with my colleague, Oriol Roca, where we were interested in looking at the uh, duration and the factors associated with intubation, there we had a slightly longer period of time in those who succeeded nasal high flow, which was three days, and only one day in those that failed nasal high flow. In a secondary study uh, we published uh, investigating the ROX uh, index, which I'll be alluded to later on, you can see that in this prospective cohort of patients, after uh, two, six, and 12 hours, we had still a very high proportion of patients um, um, on, still on nasal high flow. And after 12 hours, there were still 88% of patients uh, on the nasal high flow. And when we looked at the mean duration of um, nasal high flow before intubation, it was 96 hours in those who succeeded the nasal high flow strategy, but only 24 hours in those who failed. Last uh, data in this um, setting, uh, this is a study comparing um, awake prone position in COVID-19 pa COVID patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And there again, you can see that the duration of uh, the strategy before intubation was 2.3 days uh, in the group with nasal high flow. So this gives us a kind of time frame uh, there again to answer the poll that we are something around 24, 48 hours at the maximum. And we do have slight differences if it's a randomized controlled trial or if it's just observational. What are the risks associated with, with overuse of nasal high flow? I will point out one study that uh, alluded to this. Um, it's a study where all the patients who received nasal high flow that failed were uh, included, and the patients were classified according to whether intubation was started early within 48 hours or late after 48 hours. And mortality was strikingly different between the two groups, as you can see, between 39 and over 65%, a real big difference. When I have a closer look at the characteristics, you can see that, in fact, those patients in the early group were intubated only 10 hours after the use of nasal high flow, and those in the late group were intubated 126 hours after this. So it's a very long time, and it's over five days before intubating. How can we have a safer use of nasal high flow? Uh, to avoid this excess mortality related to late intubation. And the idea is, well, how? And it's to help clinicians by better identifying those patients who need to intubate and also to decide when to intubate them. This is why with, again, my colleague, Oriol Roca, we came up with the ROX index, which is a purely clinical score that combines in a single value the three main parameters of respiratory monitoring, respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, and inspired fraction in oxygen. And you can see the, uh, the ratio here on the slide. And in this uh, cohort of patients, we were able to identify that a cutoff value of 4.488 at 12 hours was significantly associated with a much higher risk of succeeding nasal high flow. And on the contrary, those patients with a score below this had a much higher risk of intubation, as you can see on this kaplan meier curve. We validated the score in a totally independent, prospective, different cohort of patients. And there again, we found the same cutoff value and the same um, beneficial effects of this uh, index in identifying those patients with a greater chance of succeeding the strategy. We were also able to find a lower value of the ROX index that was predictive of failure. There again, to help the clinicians decide when to intubate. So at 12 hours, we had this value of 4.88. We also uh, were able to show that this index was uh, could be used in COVID-19 patients. As you can see on this slide, in this uh, research letter published in Intensive Care Medicine one year ago, we were able to show that the patients 
who had a score above 5.37 in patients with ARDS related to COVID-19, these patients had a much lower rate of intubation compared to those who had a score below 5.37. You may ask the question, well, why is this figure different from the 4.88 you just mentioned? And the answer is because we know that COVID patients have have um, as a whole a lower respiratory rate. And because this is part of the index, well, it makes sense that the result is higher. When should we use the ROX index? Well, as soon as we start nasal high flow uh, to treat acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, where, well, everywhere where you will be using nasal high flow, intensive care, intermediate care, emergency departments. So I hope I've convinced you that time does matter when we decide of intubation in hypoxemic respiratory failure. You must be aware that there is a risk of worse outcome when intubation is unduly delayed and that a close monitoring of patients treated with nasal high flow is mandatory. And I hope I've shown that the ROX index may help clinicians to decide when to intubate patients uh, with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, including those with COVID related ARDS in order to avoid this excessive mortality rate I've illustrated. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Jean Damien. You make very clear the point that time combination with the monitoring is very important to decide intubation. So we already have three questions. From anonymous attendee, I'm sorry, I don't know the name. In which patient you will not even consider starting with high flow? What is the criteria for you to jump to intubation instead of trying high flow? So that's a, a very good point. Um, in my unit, we very often uh, use nasal high flow to pre-oxygenate the patient. So even if I know that I'm going to intubate the patient, I would start uh, nasal high flow. Uh, but bearing in mind that in the coming minutes or the coming hours, I am going to intubate. So I would say that uh, all the patients uh, will benefit from nasal high flow, even if I'm considering intubation in the coming minutes. Okay. And uh, what will be for a very severe patient, like very hypoxemic and tachypnoic, what, do you, what will be your maximum settings in your unit? Uh, what so, FIO2 would you put to the maximum flow and yes. FIO2? So the, the, the maximum FIO2 would be 100% uh, because we're dealing with very severely hypoxemic patients and we don't want to have a, a cardiac arrest related to hypoxemia. Uh, and the maximum flow on our devices is 60 liters per minute. Bearing in mind that I think it's interested and you've studied that to mother to sometimes try even higher flows even if we know that tolerance is perhaps not as good, but, but clearly maximum flow, maximum FI2 at the beginning. Okay. So then you start uh, in this uh, severe patient and uh, he, she improves, but that remains stable. So for you, being stable is a sign of uh, response or you want the patient to improve? So at the first hours, if, uh, the patient stabilizes, it's a good sign for, for, for us. Uh, when I say first hours, I would say between two and six hours. Um, and then I would like to see some kind of improvement in respiratory rate. Obviously, if we can start decreasing FIO2 and have an improvement in, in, uh, in saturation, these are good clinical indexes for us. And that's why we combine them in, in the ROCS index. Um, clearly, if uh, during the first hours of initiation of the, 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 the strategy, we see that respiratory rate is worsening, saturation is decreasing, then clearly we would consider intubation. So failure of high flow can be also a patient not changing for 12 for 24 hours definitely yes. yes okay so apart from rocking rocks index another attendee asks uh, which other criteria you use to decide to move to intubation that's a, a good point um, i think as soon as there's a, a secondary or another organ dysfunction um, clearly, we need to consider that uh, intubation must be required 
because this is not explored by the ROX index. And the two main other organ failures that are associated with nasal high flow failure are hemodynamic uh, impairment and neurological ones, which are also uh, indications for intubation. So in, in my unit, as soon as we have hemodynamic instability or a neurological impairment, we stop nasal high flow, or at least we continue it, but we use it to pre-oxygenate and to intubate. Do you perform uh, any arterial blood glass in patient blood gases in patient on high flow? So we we do them at, at the beginning after one or two hours. If if the patient was very severely hypoxemic, um, to have to see how we were able to correct this hypoxemia and also to to avoid hyperoxia, uh, because obviously saturation will not give us an indication of how far above 100 we are in terms of, of uh, uh, oxygen partial pressure. Otherwise, we rely on the, the, the pulse oximetry. OK, there is a question asking, what is the optimal value of ROX index? So I think this is interesting also. Do you target a certain ROX? Because you can modulate also the flow, the settings, to, or you, once it's above the threshold, you are happy and you leave. So that's also to a, a very good question. As, as we both discussed, the, the ROX is a dynamic um, assessment. And so we do it very regularly. If the ROX stops to increase or if it decreases, then clearly it's a sign to intubate. When it increases, we don't have a, um, a, an upper value, uh, at least at the beginning. But we are interested in looking into this value once we are thinking of weaning patients from nasal high. So I haven't any strong data to provide you right now, but clearly we're looking into that at what level of the upper limit of ROX index we can start considering withdrawal or weaning from nasal high flow. It's a very good point. And uh, for COVID-19 patient, do you uh, use high flow as first line as in normal typical pneumonia? Yes, clearly we have used nasal high flow almost from the start of the first wave. Um, and uh, we will give the, the patient a chance of a non-invasive uh, strategy. What we have, like many others, we have also combined nasal high flow with either NIV or CPAP. Uh, so clearly if, if a patient, and that answers another part of the question, if we have the sense that this patient is not improving, and we're talking about COVID uh, ARDS in this case, then we would try um, combining with uh, non-invasive ventilation. And if this is not improving, then clearly we would consider intubation. And uh, do you use uh, rocks to decide the uh, proning? Uh, no, because we tend to prone all our patients uh, awake um, in case of COVID, uh, ARDS, if, if they accept and if they are uh, comfortable with that. But what we do is that we measure the ROX index just before the proning and one hour after, because uh, very often um, these patients are very severe and they have a ROX index that would, that would mention intubation. And so if we see that after proning, the ROX index improves, then it gives us some kind of margin to say, well, we have at least this technique to, to improve the patient. If the ROX index does not improve during proning, then we really consider that the patient will require intubation. Because there are uh, at least two questions on flows higher than 60. So, and, and this come to this point of rescue. So. When we have, uh, I don't know, severe RDS intubated, you have a step up approach, no, high peep and then rescue, like a prone or ECMO. Do you, do you think that after the patient reaches the uh, high risk ROX index, like below four, let's say, you should consider like a rescue, like a proning or, a, or a higher flows, or those are before? Once it's below four, it's time to intubate. Um, I, I would rather consider trying them a bit before, uh, after, uh, again, to have a safety margin. I think these are patients are at very high risk of cardiac arrest during intubation. So I think that it's better to try these very high flow, perhaps a bit before around five. When we see that the patient is not improving, then we consider having higher flows and prone position. Um, it's always very 
tricky to use to have a rescue uh, in in the very most most severe patients. There again, because we must bear in mind these patients are not yet intubated, and we know that this procedure is at very high risk in these patients. And uh, because you mentioned the reintubation after use of iFlow after extubation, do you have a, a I don't know an idea? I don't know if there are studies on the validity of ROX index for patient failing extubation. Would you use the same criteria to decide to reintubate a patient? So um, I have uh, just retrospective data that we are currently uh, submitting for publication where we looked at the ROX index that led the level of the ROX index when we um, with, tried to withdraw a nasal high flow. Um, and there's one also one study that already published by our colleagues from Poitiers uh, who looked at the, the ROX index and what is uh, very very interesting is that we found exactly the same value of the ROX index uh, at the time when the patient was withdrawn from nasal high flow and it was 9.2. So um, we were designing currently a study to precisely explore uh, the use of the ROX index in um, anticipating and identifying those patients for whom we can um, remove the device. Okay, and then there is another question on uh, there are different competencies in different teams. For example, for someone, helmet ship up, ship up could be a step up alternative to intubation. Would you, when would you consider? I don't know what's your, because I know that NIV is not uh, seen as a step up, maybe in your unit in, around Paris, let's say. <laughs> But maybe in Italy or somewhere else, CPAP is seen as an intermediate step-up approach before intubation. What, do you have any comment on this? Yes, I, I think that the COVID has shown that, uh, um, at least in this type of ARDS, clearly uh, CPAP and, and IV had their, um, were clearly uh, useful. Um, so I think that in these patients that perhaps we managed uh, on a longer period on a non-invasive strategy because of the shortage of ICU beds and, uh, and ventilators. In fact, we had sequences where we started nasal high flow, then CPAP, then NIV. So I think it's, um, at least in this, this indication, we shouldn't be opposing only one strategy, only one device against the other. And I think what we need to do now in research is try to find which is the best sequence of these all these devices and strategies to improve outcome. So do you have criteria to use iFlow outside and inside the ICU? So would you wait a pay for a patient to reach the intubation criteria outside the ICU or there is an intermediate level where you bring him or her to the ICU before arriving to the intubation criteria, let's say? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Obviously, it depends um, of the bed capacity of the, the ICU. The problem is of having patients that are too, uh, too at too high risk of intubation on the ward is that if at the same time you have three or four patients like that that require intubation and you have only one ICU bed left, then you're in trouble. So we try to have a, a very close monitoring of these patients um, and, and we ask to, to, be, uh, to be called before they deteriorate. So we have trained uh, the nurses in the wards to use the ROX index and so they call us before that there's an, uh, uh, the, the intubation threshold. Okay, there is an intermediate level for admission yeah. to the ICU. So, uh, and uh, exactly, alterna alter alternating high flow with CPAP or NIV can ameliorate the ROX index before reaching the threshold. Do you have any, any experience on this? Well, no, but uh, the, the, there's one or two papers uh, suggesting that the ROX index could be useful um, because it obviously it was validated only during nasal high flow, but there are one or two studies indicating that it could be also helpful during NIV or, or CPAP. So I think it would be uh, interesting to have further data uh, indicating and seeing how we can use the ROX in these um, other strategies there again to combine them and to see what the best sequences 
Okay, I think we, we are reached the 3.30 p.m. People are leaving. I think we have very, very good discussion, a lot of questions. Do you have any final remarks, uh, John Damien? Well, I was very happy to see that um, many other teams all around the world started publishing on, on the ROCKS index. And I think that's very good. That means that it's just not something useful in our hands, but other people have taken on and, and gone further. And I think that's very, very good for research and for clinical care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Hamilton for this very interesting discussion. So that's a wrap for today, everybody. On behalf of Hamilton Medical, I'd like to say a big thank you to our two experts and to all of you for taking part today. Don't forget to check your inbox early next week for the link to the recording, as well as the link to additional answers for any questions that we haven't addressed today. And if you're not already signed up for future events in the series, just follow the link that should be placed in the chat or may have been already and sign up today. So thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye for now. Bye, thanks.